You see, for many of us, the problem of us getting along with other people is our inability to get along with ourselves. Everything visible and physical is preceded by something invisible and spiritual. The consequences we are dealing with in our lives, in our homes, in our culture, we are dealing with them because there is a gap between where God is and where we are. He wants to know that you want him and not just want his stuff. See, a lot of folk go to church to get God's stuff, but who don't want the God who gives it. So if you're in distress, don't let that drive you away, draw you near. When you get close and want to live for him, want to please him, want to honor him, want to exalt him, want to draw near to him, then heaven opens up and he lets you find him. He lets you find him. Our series has been called, it's called Igniting Kingdom Prayer. And the purpose of this series is connecting you with your authority, with your spiritually endowed authority granted to you by God if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But for far too many of us, we do not see clearly because we do not understand that it is our shaded view that's keeping us from experiencing what God offers. God wants you and me to have kingdom authority. Kingdom authority may be defined as the divinely authorized right and responsibility delegated to believers to act on God's behalf in spiritually ruling over his creation under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that again. Kingdom authority is the divinely authorized right and responsibility that's been delegated to believers to act on God's behalf in spiritually ruling over his creation underneath the Lordship of Jesus Christ. My purpose today is to clarify our sight line to clarify and hopefully help us to clean the glasses we're wearing and if necessary, get new ones so that we see things clearly and therefore enter prayer with spiritual authority. In verses 15 to 18, Paul prays that they will apprehend what they have. He says in verse 17, that God will give you a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of revelation. He prays in verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. All that means is so that you start seeing things as they really are and not as you think they are. He wants God to clarify. So I want you to whisper in your mind or with your lips as I'm speaking to you today, I simply want you to ask God to help you see that the eyes of your heart might be illuminated to see clearly what this authority that you possess, I possess, we possess as believers. In fact, he uses an interesting word in the end of verse 18, which are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So I'm here to declare to you, you are rich. He says, I want you to understand how rich you are in the spiritual realm that you have inherited by virtue of your faith in Jesus Christ. I know as a Christian, your major concern is when you die, you will wind up in the presence of the Lord. However, on your way there, God wants you to know there are riches, rights, and privileges that you can benefit from on your way to your ultimate destination. Paul says, I don't want you to go to heaven to see how powerful heaven is. I want you to be enlightened now about the rights and privileges that accrue to you and me and us based on our relationship with Jesus Christ. What God wants you to know me to know and us to know that there is more in there to be experienced 
not just to be held in your hand, but to be experienced. He says, I pray that your eyes might be enlightened. But our problem is we've got fog on our glasses. It's like pesticides being put on fruit and vegetables. When you put the pesticides on the fruit and vegetables, that which was designed to be organic has now become chemically induced, producing another kind of problem no matter how good it tastes. Many of us have put pesticide on what God has for us and it's contaminated it. That pesticide is called human wisdom. That is man's point of view, the human way to go, the natural way to think. And we have sprinkled pesticide on God's organic truth and wonder why we're spiritually sick even though we're still chewing on the word because it's been contaminated by what the Bible calls the wisdom of man which nullifies the manifestation, illumination, and revelation of God. He says, I pray that your eyes would be open, that you would become wise, that you would become knowledgeable in an experiential way of what God wants to do because you already have the riches. In fact, he says in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 3, you've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Everything God is ever going to do for you, he's already deposited. So you already have it. Now, having established what he's praying for, what you and I should be praying for, clear glasses so that we can see, he goes a little bit further. What does he want us to see? Well, he says, verse 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? So guess what he wants you to see? He wants you to see his power. He wants you not to talk about it, brag about it. He wants you to see it. He doesn't want you just saying God is omnipotent. He wants you to see it. He says that I'm praying that you'll see the surpassing greatness, blow your mind, power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. He says God wants to show you his muscles. God wants to show you his potency. God wants you to experience his power. He wants you to see him show off his power, demonstrate his power, not just theologize about his power. Well, how big is this power? Well, he tells you, which verse 20 he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above rule, authority, power, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Wow. Guess what kind of power God wants you and me as believers, if you're a believer, this applies to you, to experience in your life. He wants you to experience, here it is, resurrection power. He wants you to see the power that reverses things, that can take things that are dead and make them alive, take things that are bad and make them good, take defeat and make victory, take loss and wind up with gain. He wants you to see, watch this, that he can change the natural order of things. Resurrection is changing the natural order of things. Now, that's going to happen to you and me physically like it happened to Jesus when we're given our new bodies at the resurrection. But he's not talking about when believers die. He's talking about while we're still alive. He says, I want you to see it now. I want you to put on glasses so that you get to see resurrection power. Now, let's go a little deeper. When he raised Jesus from the dead, it says that Jesus being raised seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. Jesus rose on Sunday. Then he ascended 40 days later through the clouds into heaven where he sat down. Now you sit, you sit down when you finish something. Okay? The Bible says he sat down on the right hand of the Father. The Father's right hand is his power hand. 
okay? When the Bible talks about the right hand of God, it's talking about his power. So he sat in the seat of power. Hebrews calls it the throne. So he's sitting in a powerful seat on a powerful throne because he's a powerful person. So now the reversal of fortune from Friday to Sunday led to the ascension, which led to him being seated on a throne. Who sits on a throne? A king sits on a throne. So Jesus Christ is ruling. Stay with me here. Jesus Christ is in a ruling position, having experienced the physical resurrection from the dead. But where exactly is this throne? He tells you. He says this throne is located in heavenly places. Heavenly places is a euphemism for the spiritual realm. And he sits high above, it says, all rule and all authority. Don't miss that. High above all rule and all authority. Well, wait a minute. That means he cannot be overruled because everything he rules over is underneath him because he sits high above rule and authority. That's angels and every name that is named. That's humans. Jesus Christ is now ruling from heaven for the benefit of history and he cannot be overruled but he possesses veto power because while he can't be overruled any attempt to overrule him he can veto because he sits above them just like courts can veto other courts because they sit above them so he wants your eyes to be open that you got this wealth available to you to experience his power and that power is demonstrated in the person of Christ, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, which says that in Jesus' death and resurrection, Satan was defeated. So let's get this straight. You cannot now be defeated by Satan unless he's allowed to do it. And he does it now by deception because Jesus took away his fangs, okay? Bible says he took away the power of death. So Satan now must trick us to defeat us. He can't just overpower us to defeat us if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. He's got to dupe you. That's why he wants your eyes, my eyes, to be open that Satan is now under Jesus' feet. I studied the Bible in college for four years. I studied the Bible for four years working on my master's degree, another four years working on my doctoral degree. And then I've been preaching all of these years and I'm still learning new things from this awesome, inexhaustible book, The Word of God. That's why I'm so excited about the Tony Evans Study Bible and its accompanying work, the Tony Evans Bible Commentary. It will take all of this training and this teaching and make it available to you to understand, utilize, and apply God's most powerful word. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. I'm going to read verse 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And did you just see what I just read? Were your eyes open? I, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I got to read it again. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So guess what? Jesus is not the only one in heaven. Somebody's with him, together with him. Not only are there folks 
with him and together with him, they are seated beside him. It says seated with him. And they are together with him, seated with him in the same location as him. Heavenly places. Heavenly places is the spiritual realm. So guess what? Paul is praying that you and I and we understand. You're here, but you're not here. He says you have been relocated spiritually even though you are physically located right here, right now in church. He says, because if you are saved, you died with him, were raised with him, were seated with him in the heavenly places. So here's the problem. If you're seated with him in heavenly places, but you're operating from earthly places, then you're functioning from the wrong location. So the reason many of us are not seeing the power is we're operating from the wrong location. We're seated in heaven, because that's where the power is, but we're operating on earth, and there's no power there. He says, but if you learn to operate from where you are truly seated, which is in heavenly places, you're looking at things totally different because you're looking at it from God's perspective, not from man's perspective. He says, you are seated with him Authority works where Jesus Christ rules, where his jurisdiction exists. We do it all the time. What do they call it? Zoom? Teleconferencing? See, you can be in Dallas and be in a meeting in Chicago without ever leaving Dallas. Because technology has set it up that you can really be in Chicago and never leave Dallas. Because the way technology has happened is that connections are made between a place you aren't to put you there while you still aren't there. So you're physically in Dallas, but you're in the meeting in Chicago because technology has put you in two places at one time. Now, before man ever created all this techie stuff, God had a spiritual system in place to connect us from earth to heaven without leaving your location. And that spiritual connection point has every believer in heaven while they never leave the premises on earth. The problem is we get so used to earth that we never connect the spiritual technology to heaven and wind up with the limitations of earth. And therefore don't see the authority and the power that God has granted believers to experience. So how do you get to experience this? Okay, here it is. Notice verse 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here it is. You will not see the connection open up and the screen come on up there in heavenly places where you are, down here on earthly places where you sit, unless you are under Jesus' feet. You have to be under his feet. God has placed all things under his, Jesus' feet. That means under his authority, under his control, under his rule. And the one issue that must be settled is the lordship of Jesus Christ over every area of life. That that issue must get settled. When you trust Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you're now on your way to heaven. But when you submit to the lordship or the rulership of Jesus Christ over every area of your life, that's when heaven can visit you. And heaven will not visit you if you're not under his feet. Let me read to you right now Romans 14 about the lordship of Jesus Christ. Here's what it says in verses 7 through 9. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. 
For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Until he is Lord, he uses the word Lord four times in those verses. Until he is master, ruler, final decision maker, dictator, meaning you're under his foot. You know, when somebody puts their foot on somebody, they want to hold them down, okay? Unless God can hold you down, unless you are willing to say yes, Lord, to his authority, unless you and I are willing to say, I am not my own, I've been bought with a price. And that buying with a price covers all of my life my personal life, my financial life, my attitudinal life, my relational life. It covers all of my life because I am not my own. He says, I want to be Lord while you're living and when you're dead. I don't want to just be Lord when it comes time to go to heaven. I want to be Lord on your way there. Until he, we are under his feet, we will not see his authority being manifested in our experience. We won't see his power. We won't see change. See, because that, look, the way you know that this Christian thing is working is God demonstrates his power. See, when Jesus was on earth, how did they know he was the Messiah? Because of his powerful demonstrations, okay? So if you really want to know how real he is, plug into his power. But you can't plug into his power unless you're under his foot. You got to be under his authority. In other words, he must have the right to veto you. He must have the right to overrule you. He must have the right to dictate to you. He must have the right to consume you because he died and rose to be Lord, not just to be Savior. He died and rose to take you to heaven, but also rule you on earth. And if you want to see his rule on earth, then he must be Lord over all of life. The problem today is we have AM, FM Christians. They switch frequencies. You see, they heavenly on Sunday, then they go secular on Monday. You see, they, they keep switching frequencies back and forth and wonder why they don't get to hear the whole tune because they keep switching frequencies. And God says, I ain't gonna let you two time in now. You have to decide if I am Lord or if I am not. Now, if I am Lord, that means final say so, veto power, and then when it comes time for me to do something, I don't have to go far since you're sitting next to me, I can just turn. Because you're already sitting next to me in the spiritual realm. But if you're not operating from that realm, you don't even hear him talking. You don't see the riches. You don't experience the power. And Jesus just becomes a religious experience that encourages you, that inspires you, but you never see the authority, the overruling. But I will tell you this, there's nothing like seeing it. Because when, when, he, when he shows up and you get to see it, and you get to say, whoa, whoa. I just saw God do it. I just saw God do a switch on me. I, I just saw God take something dead and raise it from the grave. I, I just saw that. I was dying in this situation, dying with this problem, dying with the resources, dying with, and I just saw God flip the natural order of things. See, then you won't have to lean on somebody else's testimony because you'll be able to say, I've seen it with my own eyes. So right now, in closing, I want to switch a word. I want to switch a word. I want to change out a word, okay? Now, the word I want to change out is a great word. It's a good word, but it's a problem word. But it's a natural word. The word I want to switch out is the word commitment. See, we call on people to make a commitment. There's a problem with a good word. The problem with the word commitment is you still in control. See, when you make a commitment, you're in control. Like, like uh, we committed to lose the weight we gained over Christmas. We committed, we committed. I'm going on a diet and I'm gonna lose that weight. We committed to start working out. And our commitment began to wane, not because we weren't sincere, but we were in control. And when the control got weak, the commitment got weak. 
So I want to switch the word out. I want to switch the word out from commitment to surrender. See, see, if a man holds a gun up and says, put your hands up, he just trump commitment. I don't need commitment. I'm surrendering. I'm throwing my hands up. I ain't thinking about it. I ain't going into, do I really want to commit? Do I really want to do this? I, you, you know why? Because somebody else is in control. Somebody else got the gun. He said, sit down. You don't have to tell me twice. I'm going to sit down. Why? Because I'm not in control. You know what you do when you surrender? What you told. You see, because when you surrender, somebody else is in control. Somebody else is calling the shots. So commitment is a great word, but we, we get shaky with commitment. So let's go to surrender so that it's not up to us. It's whatever you say, boss. You the boss, man. Whatever you say, yes, sir. I surrender. I hold up my hands because you're the authority. Because now it doesn't depend on my commitment. It depends on my obedience to the authority who's telling me what to do. So I surrender. And once you surrender, heaven wakes up and say, we got one. We got one. Who's ready. Many of us are trying to get rid of something God gave you. Dr. Tony Evans says those painful problems we think of as burdens may really be blessings. One of the reasons God gives you a thorn is because he wants to show you some new things. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. When life gets thorny, many times our only instinct is to do whatever it takes to get things back to normal. But Dr. Evans explains today God just might have something bigger in mind. Let's join him in the book of Exodus as he explains. A dense fog covering seven blocks to a depth of 100 feet is composed of less than one glass of actual water. A fog covering seven blocks so you can't see even 100 feet in front of you because it's that thick only has a glass or less of water that composes that much fog. You see, there are 60 billion droplets that are spread out of particles settling over that seven block area. But it can blot out your ability to see things clearly. Many today are living in a spiritual fog. They allow a cup full of trouble, irritation, or as our text tells us today, thorns, to cloud out their vision and dampen their spirits. How do you live in the sunshine when all you see is fog? Now, Make no mistake about it. 
On a foggy day, the sun is shining. But the question is, Second Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 through 10 where Paul discusses the thorn. In verse 7 he introduces us to it, the reality of a thorn. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, that's not buffet me. <laughs> to trouble me, to torment me, to irritate me, to exacerbate me. Or to put it in everyday contemporary colloquial language, to get on my last nerve. The Greek word for thorn referred to a splinter or a needle of some kind that pricked you. We've all had a needle uh, or a thorn or a, or a splinter from wood to get in our finger or toe and irritate us. It could be used of a hook that catches a fish, piercing its 
its skin of which it can't shake itself from without tearing and making things worse. A thorn is anything that nags or irritates your life on a continuous basis. A thorn is anything that nags, irritates, exacerbates, or frustrates your life ongoingly. You can't shake it. It hangs around. Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Something to irritate me. Now, you can read commentaries galore and you'll have a lot of guesswork as to what Paul's thorn was. For example, Paul talks about how when he was trying to write the churches, he had trouble seeing. In fact, he had an emanuensis, a recorder who would write for him and so some will say, well, it was his eye problem. Uh, but still others will say, well, he was always being followed by this group called the Judaizers who were undermining his ministry. And so they were an irritation to him. Maybe it was that. Paul speaks of being lonely. He says, everyone has forsaken me. Some say it was loneliness. But the Bible never says what his thorn is, and that's good. It's good that he doesn't tell us what his thorn is so you can put your thorn here. Anything that irritates, nags, frustrates, exacerbates on a continuous level. In fact, he lays it open in verse 10. He says it can be insults, distresses, persecutions, or difficulties. Some of you are having to deal with emotional thorns. Things that have to do with your feelings. You are, you are lonely. You perhaps have been single for an inordinate amount of time and you are simply tired of being alone and it pricks you, nags you irritates you. Or perhaps it's depression that keeps popping up and you can't shake it. Maybe it's memories or regrets. When you look back over your life, you wish you could have done things differently, but you can't because that's history now. But you've not been able to shake it. It's an emotional thorn. Others have relational thorns, people who get on your nerves. They always popping up at the wrong time, which is any time they show up. This could be the person living in an unhappy marriage. They have no biblical grounds for divorce. They feel stuck spiritually but they are unhappy and it becomes an irritation. It's a relational kind of thorn. Others have financial thorns. A long time trying to find a job or the right job and it's not coming through. Or perhaps you're stuck in an unhappy work situation. Or it looks like every time you try to get out of debt, just when you think you made it, something else breaks down. Something else shows up. And you can't shake this financial situation. I guess one of the worst thorns there is are physical thorns. Disabilities, chronic illnesses, Headaches that won't go away. Things that are wrong with your body 
that are not healed. It's a thorn. Please notice this phrase in verse 7. There was given me a thorn. Now, now we could spend an hour on that. He says, my thorn was a gift. away thorns. See, now you don't hear about this too much today. You hear about how he's giving blessings. Money. Cars. Houses. Well, let me tell you something else he's giving. Thorns. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, in my humanity. And look at the theology here. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. God gave me a thorn and let the devil deliver it. Come on, work with that now. The thorn was handed to me, given to me. And you'll discover when you read the whole passage, by God. But the delivery service was a messenger of the devil. You ever looked at a, maybe you have a relational thorn, somebody in your life keeps getting on your nerves, you say, you ain't nothing but the devil. <laughs> well, you are partially right. But the gift came from God. Watch this now. 
God is sovereign, meaning he's in charge. Nothing happens, and I mean nothing. No matter how tiny or big, that either is not caused by God, he made it happen, or allowed by God, he okayed it happening. There is no third category like luck or chance or fate. Words that ought not be part of any serious Christian's vocabulary. Because to have luck, chance, or fate is to deny sovereignty. You can't have an omniscient God who knows everything and something get by him. You say, but the devil is messing with me. If the devil is messing with you, God had to okay it. There's a great example of that in Scripture. And Dr. Evans will tell us about it when he comes back in a moment with more of this lesson from his current series, Freedom Through Forgiveness. It's a look at the connection between release and relief when we experience the mercy of God and pass it along to others. And we'd like to pass along a copy of this six-lesson collection to you as our thank you gift when you support Tony's ministry with a contribution. Along with it, we'll include his companion booklet, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. It explains how, in a single month, you can learn to let go of the pain that others have caused you or that you've caused yourself. Two resources, both designed to help you break the cycle of old hurts that keep causing new hurts. Both yours with our thanks for your contribution. This offer is only available for a short time, so visit us right away at TonyEvans.org or call our 24-hour resource center at 1-800-800-3222 for details before time runs out. I'll have our contact information again for you a little later on after part two of today's lesson and this. The thing about serving an infinite God is that no matter how much you know about Him, there's always more to learn. So whether you're brand new to Scripture or an experienced ministry professional, there's something for you at the Tony Evans Training Center. You'll find online courses covering core concepts of the faith. Working at your own pace and schedule, you'll dig deep into the historical context of the book, uncover the key teachings, and learn how to apply them in real-world situations. There's lots of exclusive content from Dr. Evans to keep you interested and motivated, and an online forum where you can ask questions, get answers, and collaborate with other students. The more you learn, the more you'll want to learn. Give it a try. The Tony Evans Training Center. A world of discovery, anytime, anywhere. We all know Job, his life is falling apart. But when you read Job chapter 1, God starts it off. God says to the devil in Job 1, have you considered my servant Job? The devil says, well, the only reason he's serving you is because you're blessing him. Take away his blessings, he won't serve you. And then God tells the devil, Go right ahead. I'm going to give Job the thorn and you can deliver it. If the devil is messing with you, God okayed it first. The great question of theology is why would an all-powerful God allow a lesser creature that he created, the devil, to do what he has done. Good question, especially when you use the word allow. See, the answer is in the question. The devil is not the devil. The devil is God's devil. He operates by permission. How do you know what you're facing is a thorn? Verse 8, concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. If it's nagging you, irritating you, and getting on your nerves, you prayed about it, and God hadn't done anything about it, that's a thorn. Anybody got a thorn sticking you? Many of us are trying to get rid of something God gave you. You say, well, if God gave it, how can it be so bad? Because the devil delivered it. It was given to me. I prayed about it. I said, God, get rid of this thorn. It's sticking me. He says, I prayed three times. 
So I wasn't being carnal. I wasn't being sinful. I was talking to God. You, you told me, preacher, to pray. I prayed. And I still got this thorn. If you pray about something and you're a serious Christian and a serious prayer and it's a thorn because it's irritating you and God doesn't take it, that's because he's not finished with the gift. Because it's a gift. A thorn is a gift. It was given to me. Why would God give me a gift like that? Something that nags me in perpetuity. Something that won't go away. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Why would a good God, and God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Why would a good God give me something to prick me like this? I don't deserve this. I deserve better. Back to verse 7. There are two reasons God gives you a thorn. Number one. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. The first thing, the first reason, this is very important now, that God gives you a thorn is he wants to show you some new things. Let's look at Paul's revelation here in this chapter, verse 2. I know a man in Christ, Paul's talking about himself, in the third person, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up in the paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now watch this. Paul is the only man in all of history who was taken to heaven, got to see heaven, and allowed to come back to earth to discuss it. He says he went to the third heaven. There are three heavens. There is the atmospheric heaven, where the clouds are, the oxygen is. There is the stellar heaven, the stars, the planets, the solar system. And then there is the throne room of God, paradise the place where every believer goes when they die. That's the third heaven. He says, I was taken to paradise. I like what he says. He, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. In other words, it was a dimension I'm not familiar with. It was, it was an experience that is unlike any experience I ever had. See, see I can't fully explain heaven to you. Because it operates in another dimension. It, it operates outside of space, outside of time. He says, I cannot fully explain my state. I'm not sure how to articulate it. But this one thing I do know, what I saw up there, I cannot put words together to formulate. He calls it inexpressible. One of the reasons God gives you a thorn is because he wants to show you some new things. Things that go beyond what's normal for you. Things that go beyond what's average for you. So many Christians are satisfied with the normal. So they spend all their time trying to get rid of their thorns, complaining about their thorns, fussing and cussing about their thorns, asking why all day long when God is trying to show you something you've never seen before. And the thorn is a necessary part of the revelation. When God gives you a thorn, he has something new, something unique. God is going to expand your anointing when he increases your thorn. Did you just hear me? God's got something in store for you when he gives you a thorn. So the good news is, if you've got a thorn, it's a gift from God, but because it hurts you, delivered by the devil, 
because the God who gave the gift that was delivered by the devil has got something in store for you. Dr. Tony Evans, explaining why things that make us uncomfortable also make us grow in a message he calls, How to Understand a Thorn. It's just one part of our current series, a six-lesson collection called Freedom Through Forgiveness, which includes some bonus material we won't have time to present on the air this time around. As I mentioned earlier, you can get this six-lesson collection as our gift when you make a contribution to help keep Tony's teaching on this station, along with the companion booklet, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. As you've heard, the Urban Alternative is celebrating 40 years of ministry this year, so your support is an investment in an organization with some deep roots. But those roots sink even deeper back into Dr. Evans' early life and ministry. Here's what he told me recently about an important person and event from his undergrad days at Carver Bible College that shaped who he would become. John McNeil was a great influencer in my life in college and I would spend a lot of time talking with him. His house was on campus. So I would go over and I would do work for him in his house, just little odds and ends kinds of things. But that gave me a lot of time to spend. His wife would always feed me ice cream for doing work. And uh, there was a lot of affirmation that came from him as we were trying to deal with, because I'm now in Atlanta and the civil rights thing is, you know, hot and heavy coming out of Atlanta. And so there was a lot of tension in the air. So we were always wrestling theologically and practically with the whole uh, issue of race and the Bible. It was while I was in Atlanta that I was um, denied to go to a white church there simply because they did not want to have a, a black person in the church and the church split over it. So. There were dual tracks I was always operating on. Even when I went to college, there was a dual track because there was conservative theology, even though it was in a context of social change. So that was another crisis in my life that uh, also helped prepare me for uh, an emphasis on racial reconciliation even to today. Spreading the message of biblical reconciliation is just one of the outreaches you make possible when you support the Urban Alternative. So again, contact us today at 1-800-800-3222 and let us say thanks for your help by sending you the special two-resource package, Freedom Through Forgiveness and 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222 or make the arrangements online at TonyEvans.org. When you do, take a moment to click on the link that says Jesus. There, you'll get a clear picture of who God is, how much He loves you, and how the light of His love can drive all the darkness out of your life. Tony will talk about how the Lord's death on the cross paid the price for everything you and I have ever done wrong and made it possible for us to have a real personal relationship with God, starting now and continuing through eternity. The Bible says there's no other way to make this happen. So visit TonyEvans.org today to find out more. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Well, tomorrow, more from Dr. Evans on what our God-given thorns can teach us and how to deal with the discomfort they cause along the way. I hope you'll be with us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. are being hindered from our destiny because we're being held hostage by a leash around our souls called unforgiveness. Dr. Tony Evans explains why getting the pardon we need depends on the pardon we give. If you're holding on to vengeance, then you are blocking God from taking care of it for you. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. When we think of hostages, we picture people being held against their will or threatened in some other way. Today, Dr. Evans will talk about the kind of hostage who could walk away at any time but refuses to go. Get ready to turn to the book of Genesis as he explains. 
two monks were on their way to a particular destination. On their way, they had to cross a shallow river to get to where they were going. They ran into uh, an older lady, a heavy set lady, who was sitting at the bank of the river that they had to cross. When they got to the bank of the river and saw the lady, the lady was crying and they asked her, what's wrong? She said, I can't cross the river. I, I, I don't know how to cross the river. I'm scared to cross the river. So kindly, the monks picked up the lady and carried her across the river. When she got to the other side, she thanked them, went on her way, and they began to continue to their destination. But as they began to continue to their destination, one of the monks complained about the pain in his back. He said, boy, carrying that woman across, she was heavy set and it was difficult walking across the river and, and my back is hurting so bad. The other monk said, well, let's, let's keep on going. But after a few more steps, he said, I, I can't make it. I'm, I'm hurting too bad. The other monk said to him, what's wrong? He says, I, I'm carrying the woman. I, I'm hurting too bad. He says, aren't you hurting? The other monk said, uh, no, I, I got rid of her five miles ago. He was still carrying the woman, although the woman had long gone. A lot of us are not reaching our destination because we're still carrying the pain of the past. The weightiness of yesterday is still weighing us down, causing us pain today, keeping us from the place God wants us to arrive at. Nothing, and I mean nothing, will hinder you arriving at God's destiny for you like unforgiveness. If anybody had a right to be angry, bitter, and hold a grudge, it was Joseph. A dysfunctional family, a dysfunctional father put in a pit sold into slavery, seduced, unjustly jailed, forgotten in jail. If anybody had a right to be mad, if anybody had a right to say life is not fair, it was Joseph. Joseph occupies from chapter 37 to chapter 50 of the book of Genesis. So God wanted us to zero in on this man's life. He gave so much of the first book of the Bible to it because he wanted to show us the key to destiny. And one of the things that Joseph was going to have to grapple with, that you and I will have to grapple with, if you're going to finish life having fulfilled the reason why God left you here, then you're going to have to, we're going to have to deal with the issue of forgiveness. First of all, let's define forgiveness because part of the problem is many people don't know what it is or they don't know if they've really done it. Forgiveness in the Bible means a decision to no longer credit an offense against an offender. Forgiveness has to do with a decision. Let's start with that. It is not first and foremost an emotion. Forgiveness is not how you're feeling in any given moment. It has to do with whether you have made the choice to delete the offense. If you are seeking revenge, if vengeance is yours, forgiveness has not occurred. Because when forgiveness occurs, the delete button is pushed, or as 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, you keep no record. Forgiveness can operate on two levels, unilateral forgiveness and transactional forgiveness. Unilateral forgiveness is when you forgive and the person hasn't asked for it, requested it, or repented of what they did to you. You are unilaterally, that is on your own, without their involvement, granting them forgiveness. The reason you grant unilateral forgiveness is so that you can keep going. Because nothing will hold you hostage to your detours. 
keeping you from your destiny like unforgiveness. But then there is a second level of forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness is where there is a desire for reconciliation and restoration of a relationship. It's where the person who has offended you is willing to confess and repent in order to restore what was broken. Now, I want to show you in chapter 45 the steps you take to validate your own forgiveness. Chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood before him. He cried, have everyone go out from me so that there is no man with me when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Here's how you know you're serious about forgiveness. You don't bring other people in who have nothing to do with the sin. He told all the Egyptians, y'all leave. Y'all are not involved with this. Y'all have nothing to do with this. I'm going to confront the offenders, but y'all get out. You always know a person who is not forgiven because of the gossip. They bring people in who have nothing to do with it, who can't fix it. They can't resolve it. They don't even know about it, but I want to bring them into it because I want to vent because I'm seeking vengeance. True forgiveness does not bring people into it who have nothing to do with it. So if you are gossiping to everybody else about the offense and the offender, forgiveness has not occurred. Secondly, you know you have forgiven when you make the offender feel at ease with you. Verse 4, then Joseph said to his brethren, please Come closer to me. Ah. When you haven't forgiven, you say, get away from me. He says, come, you did me wrong. Come close to me. I am now welcoming you into my space. He makes them feel comfortable in his presence instead of making them feel uncomfortable in his presence. He says, come near, not get out of my sight. I can't stand you. Don't want to ever see you again. Get away from me. No, he says, come near to me. And these were the ones who've done him wrong. So forgiveness creates a space where the offender who repents, because we're talking about transactional forgiveness now, not unilateral, where the offender can come into a space they've been extricated from because of their offense. The next thing that happens, verse 5, now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. The next thing that true forgiveness will do is it will help the offender to forgive themselves when they've asked you to forgive them. And then he did one more thing. Wow. Verse 9, Harry and go to my father, Joseph says, and say to him, my father Jacob, say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. I, I don't want you to miss this. He tells his brothers, go back home and tell daddy, I'm okay. Up here, in Egypt. Wait a minute, you mean you're not going to tell him to go tell daddy what y'all did to me? You're not going to go back and tell daddy I want y'all to go back and I want y'all to tell daddy every little thing y'all did to me, how you did it, I want you to go tell daddy. What he did was he protected them from the one who would have been hurt most by it because he was seeking transactional forgiveness. If you're holding on to vengeance, watch this, then you are blocking God from taking care of it for you. If you're trying to pay him back yourself, then God will let you pay him back yourself. 
but God will stay out of it. The scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. God believes in justice. He believes in payback, his way, his time, and he does it without your help. I'm not talking about somebody who breaks the law. That's a legal issue. It should be addressed. But we're talking about personal vengeance. He says that I will repay. And if you read the story, you'll find out he did. Dr. Evans will have more for us on the link between forgiving and being forgiven when he comes back in a moment to continue this lesson from his series, Freedom Through Forgiveness. This short but powerful six-part set points the way toward the healing and fulfillment we can experience when we understand the mercy God has shown us and pass it along to those who've hurt us, even if those hurts feel like they're tearing us apart. Unforgiveness is like an emotional cancer, but the principles in this message collection are the cure. And we'll send it to you as our thank you gift when you make a contribution to help us keep Tony's teaching on this station. Along with it, we'll include his companion book for this series, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. It's a step-by-step, month-long journey toward freedom from the wrongs done to you or by you. Visit us at TonyEvans.org, make your contribution online, and let us send you a copy of the special two-resource package before time runs out next Wednesday. Or give us a call at 1-800-800-3222. Our resource center is open 24-7, so there's always someone waiting to help you. Again, that's TonyEvans.org or call 1-800-800-3222. Well, Dr. Evans will come back with more of today's message right after this. It's beyond a Sunday sermon, a chance to really dig into the Bible and the kingdom in a new way. Anytime and anywhere, because it's all online. The Tony Evans Training Center, in-depth courses on all kinds of topics, Cultural Transformation, Intro to Expository Preaching, Jude, John, Hebrews, Old Testament, New Testament, and so much more. These aren't sermons. They're teaching courses to help you engage, understand Scripture, and not just to hear about, but to explore the kingdom of God on your own. Find out more at TonyEvansTraining.org, TonyEvansTraining.org. Take Judah. And the reason I want to talk about Judah is because he was the lead guy who got Joseph put in the hole to begin with when he was 17. Judah said, let's get rid of him. Well, if you read the story, you will find a whole chapter on Judah. Now, why is Judah put in this story with a whole chapter on him when the whole story is about Joseph? But there's a whole chapter on Judah because it's showing you how God pays somebody back who messes over you. Because when you read the story of Judah... In the middle of the story of Joseph, Judah starts losing his sons to death. He gets tricked by his daughter-in-law, has an affair with his daughter-in-law, giving birth to a child from his own daughter-in-law. His whole life crumbles because God will repay. But if you don't believe that, then you get to pay it without God. But if you believe that, then you know vengeance is mine. And you know, when God moves, he moves. Ah. What helped Joseph to forgive? This was a painful situation he's lived through. Verse 50 through 52. Now, before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of own bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. He named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. God set him up for forgiveness. He gave him a whole new family and he said, my new family helped me forget my old family. And the way he kept reminding himself that he was no longer hostage to his old family was in naming his kids. He named one Manasseh and one Ephraim. Manasseh means God has helped me to forget my troubles. Well, how often?
often did he have to say the name Manasseh? Every time he was calling him to dinner, every time he was correcting him, when he was sending him to school, Manasseh this, Manasseh that, Manasseh this, Manasseh that. So every time he called Manasseh's name, God has helped me to forget. God has helped me to forget. God has helped me to forget. He named the baby exactly what he needed from God. But to help Manasseh out, you need to have a second baby. Ephraim. Ephraim means God has made me fruitful. Watch this now. And he says, in the land of my affliction. Okay, Manasseh, God has caused me to forget. That is the pain. Ephraim, he's blessing me where I am right now. See, if you get so locked into the past that you don't see the goodness of God that he is showing you right now. See, you need to say Manasseh, but then you got to turn and look at Ephraim. Because Ephraim says, oh, well, what that happened to me yesterday, but God is providing for me today. He's blessing me today. He's taking care of me today. And even though I had a bad yesterday, my baby's name is Ephraim today. Unforgiveness blocks you from the supernatural. Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You read further in the chapter and he says, for if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. We all have to remember we got two sides to our story. The need to forgive and the need to be forgiven. There are very few people who need to forgive who don't also need to be forgiven. Okay? Forgiveness is a beautiful word when you need it. It's an ugly word when you have to give it. But we all need both words. Because we need to be forgiven and we need to forgive. He says, and when you do, your Father who is in heaven will forgive you. He's not talking about your salvation. He's talking about your fellowship, your harmony, your experience with him. You no longer walk in darkness, John chapter 1 says. You're now living in the light. You're in the light of the supernatural. Your GPS is working now. He can move you on to the place he's taking you. God will recycle your pain to his purpose. Doesn't excuse it. Vengeance is mine. It doesn't say you ignore it. Not saying any of that. I'm saying you have a providentially sovereign God who can overrule it and fulfill his purposes in spite of it and in fact use it for where he's taking you. You've seen the movie. I'm sure 90% of you have the old movie Forrest Gump. You remember Forrest had a, a friend from his childhood days named Jenny. And one day Forrest and Jenny were walking along and they came across the shack in which she was raised, which was also the shack in which she was abused by her parents. When she walked by her old home, that shack, she looked at it, she reached down, she picked up a rock and threw it at the shack. Then she reached down she picked up another rock and threw it through the window of the shack. And then she reached down and she picked up another rock as she remembered the pain of the past. And after she had thrown as many stones or rocks as her energy would allow, she collapsed. And that's when Forrest looked at her and said, Jenny, Sometimes they're just on enough rocks. Because no matter how many you throw in, that shack is still up there. Some of us have been throwing stones at the shack. Uh, why did you do that? Why didn't you stop him? Why did I have to go through that? That was not fair. Stop! I can't take it anymore. You throw rocks, but the shack is still up. Because sometimes, there are not enough stones. Dr. Evans will come back in a moment with a final illustration to wrap up this message he calls The Detours of Pardon, part of his current series, Freedom Through Forgiveness. Copies of this individual message are available. Just visit TonyEvans.org to get the details. 
Better yet, request this entire six-lesson collection when you make a contribution toward the ministry of The Urban Alternative. And we'll send it to you along with the companion booklet I mentioned earlier, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. Just visit TonyEvans.org to get the details and make the arrangements. Or call us day or night at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. As you heard at the top of the program, the Urban Alternative is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. The expansion and growth we've experienced is nothing short of a miracle. And a lot of it traces back to the unique way Dr. Evans communicates across racial and cultural lines. Here's what he told me recently about how the Lord equipped him to do that. I was the fourth African-American student at Dallas Theological Seminary. So many of the students there were not used to being around black people. But because of my personality, I, I would take the initiative, build relationships. I could see those who didn't want it versus those who were open to it versus those who were confused about it. Went and knocked on doors, met professors, talked to them. So I would take the initiative to not only learn, but to build bridges. But at the same time, I went to a black church there, Community Bible Church, headed by a guy named Reuben Connor. And uh, this um, kept me in touch with the black community. And he had a ministry starting black churches. And so that kept me involved in black church ministry while attending a conservative white theological center. So I'm still operating on dual tracks. And so I think that, again, kept me in both worlds, biblical conservative theology, but operating in two directions. In one direction, I wanted to strengthen the biblical foundation in the African-American community. In the other direction, I wanted to increase the social sensitivity in the white community. Well, Dr. Evans says forgiving others releases us from one source of pain and prevents a brand new one. He'll tell us what it is tomorrow. But right now, he's back with a final thought for those who aren't feeling free enough to forgive. But you say, Pastor, I still feel it. I still feel it. Well, let me remind you about the bell. You know, the bell in the bell towers is on a rope. And you pull the rope, bong, 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 bong. And then they would let the rope go. And you'd still hear, bong, 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 bong. Because when they let go of the rope, the bell would still be swinging, but it would slow down until it stopped. 